the uh, topic at hand really, I think is uh, a good reminder for all of us, and that is what's going to be happening very soon. That is the holy month of Ramadan. And I think it is uh, a topic that even though all of us have heard over and over again, it's something that requires a refreshment. It's something that we help when we listen to the ayat and a hadith that will motivate us about this blessed and holy month. Because in the end of the day, it is indeed uh, the month that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen to rejuvenate our iman. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, in the very first surah, in the very first juz of the very first surah. And by the way, Surah Al-Baqarah is an amazing surah. And Surah Al-Baqarah, the first juz of Surah Al-Baqarah is really like an introduction to the whole Quran. It tells us about the basics of Iman. It tells us about the beginning of the creation, the Genesis story. It tells us about the prayer. It tells us about charity. It tells us about fasting. It tells us about Hajj. All of the Arkan of Iman and the Arkan of Islam are discussed in the first juz of the first surah of the Quran. It's really an amazing uh, introduction to the, to the whole Quran. And of what Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah is the verses pertaining to Siyam. And these verses are the most explicit verses in the whole Qur'an pertaining to Siyam. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe, kutiba alaykum as-siyam. Kutiba, ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum as-siyamu, kama kutiba ala ladheena qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. O you who believe, fasting has been ordained for you. Notice Allah is speaking in the third person. It has been ordained. Meaning it's a done deal. Before even this legislation had come, I had already decreed that fasting had, would have been ordained for you. It's a done deal. It had been ordained. It's something that had been predetermined. That as Muslims, because Allah links fasting to Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. O you who believe, fasting. So iman and fasting go hand in hand. And that is why if you don't fast and you have the capacity to do so, this is in fact actually hurting your iman. It is going to the very core of your iman. So O you who believe, fasting has already been ordained for you. Then Allah tells us, you're not the only group that has ever fasted. You're not the only group, you're not the first group. All other civilizations before you, I had ordained fasting for them. كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مَقَبْلِكُمْ So Allah is saying, this has always been a part of my decree, that all those who believe in me shall be of those who are fasting. And it is uh, well known that Christians and Jews, the Orthodox amongst them, they still observe fasting rituals. However, they have changed those rituals. They have modified them. You know, the Catholics have Lent, the Orthodox Jews have their days. They've modified them and they have abandoned the original fast, but the concept of fasting is still found amongst them. And we are the only tradition that has preserved the concept of fasting the way that Allah Azza wa Jal intended it. But Allah has said all nations have been given the concept of fasting. Then Allah tells us the wisdom. Why has He ordained fasting for us? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you can attain taqwa. And the best way to translate taqwa is the consciousness of Allah, God consciousness. And it is so true that nothing brings about consciousness of Allah like fasting does. No other act of worship. Now, let us ask ourselves, those who pray regularly, inshallah all of us are those who pray regularly five times a day, ask yourselves, and I ask myself, the prayer, has it truly served its purpose for us? Or unfortunately, has it become monotonous routines? The fact of the matter is that most of the time, our salah has become simply a habit. We look at the watch, say, oh, it's time to pray dhuhr. Let me quickly go pray dhuhr. As we move up and down, our brain is attached with our finances. Our soul is attached with what's going to happen today and tomorrow. The, the, the salah, astaghfirullah, has become a ritual. Of course, it shouldn't be. I'm saying this is the reality. Zakat, I mean, you write a check and you're done. You give some money and khalas, the fundraiser is taking place. You give your money, done. Hajj, well, we don't go every year. And if we go once every 10, 20 years or something, yes, that's indeed a very moving experience, but it's not something regular. So what then will bring about that consciousness of Allah? Look at ourselves in Ramadan. An amazing transformation takes place in Ramadan. Even the ones amongst us who are not practicing Islam, even the ones who don't even really come to the masjid, pray regularly, in Ramadan, all of a sudden, we rediscover our faith. In Ramadan, we begin monitoring our speech, our action, our gaze. All of a sudden, things that we did regularly, routinely in Ramadan, lower gaze, suffer, I'm fasting. 
saying something, oh, I can't say that I'm fasting. Even the environment, ah, I shouldn't be here, I'm fasting. In other words, the consciousness of Allah is demonstrated in Ramadan. And what did Allah say? I legislated fasting for you so that you're going to attain consciousness. And all of us notice this reality in our lives in Ramadan. Without exception, when Ramadan comes along, we are forced to attain that consciousness of Allah. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So Allah tells us the wisdom and we experience the wisdom ourselves. And the purpose of Ramadan is to fortify that taqwa, to solidify, to strengthen that taqwa. Then Allah says, أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودَاتِ limited number of days meaning guys Ramadan is not forever it's limited Allah is stressing it's just a few days take advantage of it you know when one of our department stores has a sale it says limited time only 10 days only why do they have that 10 days only because if you don't act you're gonna miss out they want to tell you you better get your act you want to purchase this 10 day sale well to Allah belongs the perfect example. Ramadan is infinitely more important than these sales that we have. And Allah is telling us, don't take Ramadan for granted. Ayyaman ma'dudat. Limited number of days. And every one of us as well, we can testify. When Ramadan comes, before we know it, oh, the first week's over. Oh, the first third is over. My God, it's already the 15th. The last 10 is starting. Then, khalas, it's over. It's a clock down, a countdown. 29, 28, 27. Ayyaman ma'dudat. So Allah is saying, take advantage of Ramadan day by day, night by night. It's something that is only there for the short period of time. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the next verse, the most powerful verse that links Ramadan to the Qur'an. شَهْرُ Ramadan الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ Quran. Now this is an amazing verse because in this verse, firstly by the way, the month of Ramadan is the only month that Allah mentions by name in the whole Qur'an. There's no other month that Allah mentions by name. Shahru Ramadan, the month of Ramadan. So Allah mentions it by name. And merely mentioning it by name, it blesses Ramadan above all the other months. No other month has Allah mentioned by name in the Qur'an. And Allah called it the month of Ramadan. Shahru Ramadan. Then, secondly, what's really interesting here, Allah didn't say the month of Ramadan is the month of your fasting. No. Allah linked Ramadan to something else. The month of Ramadan is the month of the Quran. The Quran tells us that Ramadan has more of a linkage with the Quran than it does with the Siyam. Unfortunately, we are the ones that have reversed this. For us, Ramadan comes more about the fasting than the Qur'an. But in the Qur'an, Allah emphasizes that Ramadan has to do with the Qur'an. And then in the next paragraph, Allah says, so whoever is there amongst you, fast as well. Fasting comes after Qur'an for the month of Ramadan. But for most amongst us, we don't Pay attention to this. And we link and associate Ramadan with Siyam more than we associate Ramadan with the Quran. But Allah says, Shahru Ramadan, Alladhi Unzila fihi al Quran. This is the month Allah chose to reveal the Quran. And there are two revelations that took place in Ramadan. Ibn Abbas tells us that in the month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran from the Lawh al Mahfuz. The Lawh al Mahfuz is the original preserved tablet in the heavens with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah revealed the Quran. So, the actual, if you want to call it the original Quran, if you like, the Quran that is written in the Lawh al Mahfuz, the original Quran, for lack of a better term, that is written in the Lawh al Mahfuz. Allah sent that copy of the Quran down to the lower heavens in the month of Ramadan. The whole Qur'an physically came down to the lower heavens. And Ibn Abbas says Allah housed it in a abode, in a chamber called Baytul Izza, the house of Izza. It is the house of honor, the house of glory. This happened in Ramadan. So the physical mushaf that Allah wrote in the Lawh al-Mahfuz 
came down in the month of Ramadan to this lower heaven. Then in the month of Ramadan, according to most scholars, on the day after Laylatul Qadr, whenever it was Laylatul Qadr, the next day, the next morning, Jibreel came to the Prophet ﷺ in Ghari Hira and said to him, Iqra. So the story of Iqra actually takes place in the month of Ramadan on the odd day following the odd night of the last 10 nights, which night we don't know because Laylatul Qadr is shrouded in mystery. Either the 21st or the 23rd or the 26th or 27th, excuse me, the 29th. One of those days, Jibreel came the day after the night of Laylatul Qadr, right? You get it? The day after the night of Laylatul Qadr and Jibreel began the actual revelation of Iqra, of the Quran. So both the Mus'haf and the Tilawa began in Ramadan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that Ramadan is the month of the Quran. It is the Quran that came to guide you. So just like the Quran is your spiritual guide, so too in terms of time, Ramadan is the time guide. The book that will guide you is the Quran. The one time frame that you will be the most guided in is Ramadan. Ramadan is the month of the Quran. And therefore, the Prophet ﷺ himself established the Sunnah of reading the Quran and listening to the Quran in the month of Ramadan. We learn from the hadith in Sahih Bukhari that our Prophet ﷺ said to our mother Aisha, he said, O oh Aisha, Jibreel would come to me every year to recite the Quran and to have me recite it. And this year, he asked that I do it twice. And I have no explanation other than this is my last Ramadan. So he has a premonition that he's about to pass away. And that premonition proved to be true. That premonition proved to be true. But the point of the hadith that I'm quoting it is we learn that the sunnah of reading the Quran in Ramadan and of listening to the Quran in Ramadan. So there's two different sunnahs. You read and you recite or listen to. You recite and you listen. And Allah Azza wa Jal sent the most noble angel to the most noble human being so that both of them can read and recite to one another in the month of Ramadan. Every day and every night, Jibreel would come and recite and listen back and forth. And from this, later scholars have extrapolated the concept of reciting the Quran completely in Taraweeh. Now, of course, our Prophet ﷺ did not do this because he did not pray 30 nights of Taraweeh. Our Prophet ﷺ only prayed three nights of Taraweeh and then he said, I don't want to establish this because it might, you might think it's obligatory and I don't want to make Taraweeh obligatory on you. So he only prayed three nights of Taraweeh. But when Umar ibn al-Khattab reinstituted the Sunnah of Taraweeh, the later Sahaba began to simply divide the Quran into 30 parts and every day would recite 1 30th because it made sense. And the Ummah has accepted this custom and concept. And its original basis goes back to the Hadith of Bukhari that Jibreel and the Prophet would recite the Quran back and forth to one another. And so it is a healthy concept that yes, it is good to revive that some masajid should finish the whole Quran. But it is also my opinion, by the way, that some masajid should not because not everybody can stand an hour and a half, two hours in taraweeh. And we should also cater to those who can only spend half an hour. And this is my humble opinion, that every community should have a diversity. Some masajid have long taraweeh, other masajid have short taraweeh. You have to cater to the whole community. Those that cannot stand two hours, have some taraweeh for 30 minutes so that they can go pray something and then go back home so that they get something done as well. But in any case, the point is that it's healthy and good for some masajid to have the whole Quran recited. And therefore, you will listen to the Quran. But that listening doesn't do the job of you reciting. Don't confuse the two. You as well should be reciting the Quran. And it is healthy for you to finish at least one Quran per Ramadan. And many of the scholars of the past would do multiple times in the month of Ramadan. But it is an established sunnah to read the Quran and to listen to the Quran in the month of Ramadan. So the month of Ramadan is in fact the month of the Quran before it is the month of Siyam. Then the next paragraph Allah says, So whoever amongst you witnesses the month, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْهُ Let him fast the month. This is a command. You must fast the month. 
and then Allah says except if you're sick or traveling and then there are exceptions there are exceptions if you're sick you're elderly you know the women in their cycles whatnot there are exceptions they of course a different story but if you are healthy and you are not traveling Fasting is obligatory and alhamdulillah it is one of the signs of Iman and also one of the signs of the blessedness of Ramadan that the entire ummah by and large observes fasting. The fact of the matter is that perhaps up to 90% of the ummah that is capable of fasting actually fasts and that is truly a remarkable number. By the way these statistics are not just out of my head. Uh, Pew surveys have been done, professional Gallup polls and whatnot have been done and uh, unfortunately, the number of people who pray worldwide is not that much. It's probably in the 30 or 40 percent who pray regularly, right? So one out of every three Muslims maybe prays regularly, which is still, I think, a big number compared to the other religions. But when it comes to fasting, mashallah, tabarakallah, the surveys have shown like in the high 80s, low 90s across the globe, the ummah by and large is observing fasting. And this is of the barakah of Ramadan, that the globe over, alhamdulillah, they by and large, they uh, observe this phenomenon. And as we all know, wallahi, all of us know this. How many of our friends, our relatives, our cousins, we don't see any religiosity from them whatsoever, except in the month of Ramadan. All of a sudden in Ramadan, something happens. And mashallah, tabarakallah. And wallahi, yes, you can look at the negative, but let's look at the positive. At least they're doing something. At least the Ramadan has brought something good out from them. So inshallah, there's hope in them. Wallahi, there's hope. If Ramadan makes you a better person, there's still hope for you, inshaAllah ta'ala. So never lose hope from the someone who at least is showing good at some points in his or her life. The point being that Allah Azza wa commanded us to fast the month of Ramadan after He made the association of the Qur'an with Ramadan. And then Allah Azza wa Jal says, uh, then Allah Azza wa Jal says, uh, for, uh, for, um, what is the verse I'm thinking about? Uh, this is an amazing, now by the way, I'm talking about Surah Al-Baqarah, the one page of the Quran where all of it is due to fasting, dedicated to fasting, right? The whole page is about Ramadan and fasting. And I'm just doing a quick explanation of, of that, uh, of those ayat. Then Allah says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَى Allah wants to make things easy for you and He does not want to make things difficult for you. Now, this phrase, very interesting that Allah places this phrase in the context of fasting. Very interesting that this phrase occurs in the context of fasting. Why so and how so? Well, because all of us, right now Ramadan is barely... Uh, 10, 11, 12 days away. We're all wondering, how am I going to fast Ramadan? For you guys here in Leicester, how long is the fast this month? 20, 21 hours? It feels like 21. <laughs> <laughs> so our brother automatically says it feels like 21 hours, but in fact it's 18? Depends on which school of thought you follow, huh? That's, <laughs> that's one of your problems here up north, subhanAllah. Uh, so even if it's 20 hours, right? I mean, I myself am wondering, how do you guys do 20 hours? And you at this point in time are wondering, how am I going to do 20 hours? <laughs> but you know, as well as I do, that come the first day and you sit down for your iftar, you're like, my God, wow. Wasn't that bad? We did it. And the next, and the third, and the fourth, until finally, it becomes so easy. You're like, why don't I fast every single day of my life? <laughs> and we also know that right now, this week, for example, if one of us were to mix, miss our lunch, or our, we weren't to drink water in the hot weather, or we're to, I'm addicted to coffee, let's say, right? I need my caffeine dosage in the afternoon. If I don't get my caffeine dosage, then I get headaches, the caffeine headaches that you get, right? If I don't have lunch in Houston, I live in America, and in Memphis, you, you think this is hot. This is nice, cool breeze right now, mashallah. For us in Houston, where, where I'm raised and born, in Memphis, where I live, I mean, we get the, the actual heat. It's very hot over there. And if you don't drink, it's very possible you get dehydrated. Regular days. But in Ramadan, subhanAllah, 
it's as if quite literally a miracle happens because it is a miracle it really is a miracle because try it one day today skip your lunch you're not going to be able to concentrate normally by the time three four hours comes you're going to wonder like how, how do i function it's not going to happen but in ramadan you skip your lunch your regular breakfast no water no tea no coffee and the day goes by yeah it's not it's not easy but it's not difficult as i'm trying to say you struggle a little bit but it's not the struggle that you would do outside of Ramadan if you skipped a lunch. Do you see what I'm saying here? Right? And this is what Allah is saying. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ Allah wants to make things easy for you. He does not want to make things difficult for you. Meaning, I know Ramadan is scary for you guys. But don't worry, I will make it easy for you. Allah is promising you that Ramadan is not going to be difficult. And you know, without even knowing this verse, or many, maybe some of you haven't concentrated on it, but you know it to be true. You understand what I'm saying here? Every one of you and myself who have fasted Ramadan in the past, we all know this verse to be true, even if we never paid attention to it. Ramadan, before it happens, we're all worried and scared. But in the middle of it, it's a piece of cake. It's not difficult at all. Why? Because Allah has guaranteed us. He's not going to make it difficult. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ So the point is, when we put in the effort, put in the niyyah to fast Ramadan, Allah will bless us to make the difficult easy. This is a guarantee from Allah in the Qur'an. And I testify, and I know all of you testify to this reality. When we have the himma, the courage, the iman, the ikhlas, when we have the himma, we're going to do it. And we wake up for suhoor. And we put in our niyyah that Allah Azza wa Jalla will help us. Guess what? Allah helps us. And the day goes by like a breeze. Yes, some difficulty. Nobody's saying that's the whole point. Just enough though, just enough that you can bear. And nothing as if today or yesterday or tomorrow you skipped lunch and dinner. You skipped, you know, breakfast. You skipped nothing like that. You see my point here, right? And subhanallah, it is as if we are miraculously being fed. Our sustenance is coming and we don't even understand. There are days, wallahi, that, yani in, at least in America, maybe not over here that much, but you're sweating, sweating, sweating. You're like, where is this water coming from? You know, where is this water coming from? But subhanallah, it happens. And yes, finishes and goes by and the next day comes. It is as if, indeed, as our Prophet ﷺ said, eating suhoor, there is barakah in it. You eat a small amount, but it will become nourishing for the rest of the day. That's what our Prophet ﷺ commanded us. That eat suhoor, eat the morning meal, sahri as we call it in, in Urdu. Eat the suhoor, because in eating the suhoor, there is barakah. What does barakah mean? Barakah means an increase in good, an increase. So you eat a small amount, but that small amount will suffice you for the whole day. So, my dear brothers and sisters, so, and then by the way, after this Allah says, وَلِتُكْمِلُوا الْعِدَّةَ the, the, the verse is ending, now let me finish it up. And so that you may finish the prescribed quantity. So, in the beginning Allah says, أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودَاتِ Limited number of days. In the end Allah says, so that you may finish the prescribed quantity. The beginning and the end both emphasize one thing, and that is what? It's a limited number of time, limited number of days. You have to take advantage of this time. Then, so that you may praise Allah because He has guided you, and so that you may thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the month of Ramadan is the month of the Quran. The month of Ramadan is the month of Siyam. The month of Ramadan is the month of dhikr. So you make dhikr of Allah. So you should say tasbih, tahmeed, takbir, tahleel. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah. You keep on making dhikr. And you may thank Allah. And then one more verse after it, and then we'll finish it. I'll open the floor for QA. One more verse after it, and that is وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ 
That verse is about making dua to Allah. So Ramadan is linked with dua as well. So we have the Quran, we have Siyam, we have Dhikr, we have Taqwa, we have thanking, وَلَعَلَّكُمْ tashkurun. And then the very last verse, when, your servant, when my servants ask you about me, tell them, I am close to them. I respond to the dua of the one who makes dua when he makes dua. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ So when he makes dua, I will respond to that dua. So let him make dua to me. So Ramadan is also the month of dua. And especially right before breaking the fast. Our Prophet ﷺ said there is one time that the, the dua is never rejected and that is at the time of breaking the fast. So when we sit down and make this a habit in your iftar gatherings, when you go to your davats every day, there's davats in Ramadan, mashallah, tabarakallah. When you go there, make sure you tell them this hadith that our Prophet ﷺ said that the dua at the time of iftar is never rejected. So before the iftar, those five minutes, ten minutes, right before the iftar, it should be the time that all conversation kind of shuts down, that people make their dhikr and their dua, because that is the most difficult time, when the smell of the samosas waft in, right? <laughs> when you see all of those delicacies right there, sitting in front of you on the table, waiting to jump into your mouth, if you can concentrate on your dua at that time, if you can cut off that, and concentrate on raising your hands to Allah, that dua is never rejected. So look at how many things this verse tells us about the blessings of Ramadan. Ramadan is the month of the Quran. Ramadan is the month of the masjid as well, by the way. The masajid are jam-packed in Ramadan. Ramadan is the month of Islamic brotherhood. Look at all of the brothers and sisters that come together in the masjid. You meet them every single day. You kind of miss it after it's over. Like, you know, you miss the brotherhood. Ramadan is the month of charity. How much charity we give in, in, in Ramadan? Ramadan is the month of generosity. How many people we invite, to, how much people we feed? Ramadan is the month of all of these things together. Ramadan is the month of salah, of tilawa, of Quran, of so subhanAllah. It is quite literally as if Ramadan is the month of rejuvenating our iman. And that's really the goal, taqwa, that Ramadan comes, we feel that passionate boost. We, you know, all of us, we need that energy to be. You know, the battery dies, right? You need the, the recharger. All of us, this is our recharger. Just like we plug in the iPhones. Hmm? iPhones, we plug in, okay. Uh, we plug in our, even our car batteries die, something. Our iman as well kind of goes down. What's the thing we need to plug in? It's Ramadan. Ramadan is the recharger. And alhamdulillah, we thank Allah for uh, Ramadan. We thank Allah Azza wa for having blessed us with this great month. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us life to live to the month of Ramadan. He gives us iman to perfect our iman in this month. And he then accepts the good deeds of this month. Jazakumullahu khairan. How much time do we have left? 10 minutes for Q&A inshallah, I think, right? 10 minutes for Q&A inshallah. Uh, and then we are done. So let me just jump in straight because we're very tight for time. No need for your thanks and whatnot. Bismillah, go ahead. <laughs> Reciting Quran has to be in Arabic. There is no recitation of the Quran in non-Arabic. You read the translation for yourself in non-Arabic. But that's not the Quran. So when you say pray, what do you mean? You mean dua or you mean Quran? Uh, Quran like reading, because I personally usually read the Quran in English. So, uh, that's not so reading so the Quran. That wouldn't count as reciting. No, reading the Quran is only in Arabic. When you say you read the Quran in English, you should say I'm reading a translation. I'm reading a meaning. The Quran by definition is only in Arabic. So when you read in English, you are simply reading for the sake of knowledge and good, that's good. But there's no inherent barakah in, you don't do tilawa of the English. The English is human. It is the original Arabic that is divine. So my, uh, my suggestion to you would be Unless you have, mashallah, like six, seven, eight hours a day, or maybe even four or five hours a day, where, okay, at least 30, 40 minutes you can do the English translation. Otherwise, in Ramadan, put aside the translation. Just emphasize the Arabic. Outside of Ramadan, yes, read the translation as well, get the meaning. But Ramadan is the month of the Quran, and the Quran is the Arabic Quran. Okay, Allah knows best. Yes, go ahead. Um, just a quick question on the Torah. So you said um, during. 
many of us in nowadays have forgotten, I don't know if it's the correct word, the etiquette of du'a, or how to go about du'a. So, in terms of when you say that, you can't be specific in your du'a or ask for a certain something. Is that correct or is that wrong? That is incorrect. You can ask for a certain something. But can you ask for a specific certain income and just say, for example, a new car? <laughs> I want a Mercedes yeah. C-Class, what is it, 500, yeah. SEL, yeah. what not, huh? <laughs> okay. So, um, <laughs> you are allowed to ask for a, so, let me, let me categorize. There's two general uh, types of dua, the religious dua and the worldly dua. The religious du'a, you want hidayah, maghfira, forgiveness, jannah, protection from jahannam, okay? Those du'as, you ask without any qualifications. You say, oh Allah, I want jannah. End of story. There's no qualifications. Oh Allah, protect me from jahannam, okay? You ask unconditionally because you want it. Worldly du'as, it is not wise to ask for specifics. Nor is it proper etiquette, but it is halal. There is a difference between the two. It's not haram. You want the Mercedes 500, whatever, SEL, you know, whatever it is, okay? Or, mashallah, tabarakallah, you are wanting a particular sister to marry, mashallah, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh Allah, Sister Fatima, please. <laughs> Let her father say yes to me. <laughs> For example, okay? Is it halal? No, because it's a serious question. Is it halal? And the answer is yes, it is halal. But is it wise? No. Why is it not wise? Because you do not know whether that car or that job or that sister is for actually your best interest or not. You do not know. So you should put a condition. So for example, you apply to 10 jobs and you want that particular job. And wallahi, it's natural. Nothing wrong with wanting one job out of those 10. It's human nature. You want a particular spouse. You know, you're interested in a particular person. It's human nature. Nothing wrong with that. But you should add a condition. Oh Allah, bless me with that job or that sister if it is in my best dini and dunyawi interest, religious and worldly interest. Oh Allah, bless me with that job if it is the best job for me. Otherwise, give me the better job. So that you put a condition on, because you do not know what is best for your dunya. But for the akhirah, there are, is Jannah better for you or not? Yes or no? See? There's no question about the akhirah. Okay? So, uh, one more point. When you ask about dunya matters, make sure that it doesn't become your only goal. Make sure that you have lots of religious matters, and then yes, you have some dunya matters as well. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al-nar. You want good in this world, don't forget the next world and and being saved from Jahannam as well. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay, sisters, any questions? This is going to Bismillah. Uh, uh, is there a specific thing that you uh, urge us to do this Ramadan? That I urge you all to do this Ramadan? Yeah. I don't want to do anything one specific, I'll tell you a number of things. First and foremost, every one of you, without exception, every one of you, put it in your mind. I will finish an entire recitation of the Qur'an. No excuses. Every one of you can do that, okay? It's not that difficult. It's 20 pages of Arabic a day. Seriously, all of us can do that. 20 pages a day, you can do that. Put it in your mind. Secondly, you make it a point to pray taraweeh. Every single night you're able to pray taraweeh. If you're not able to go to the masjid, you pray it at home. But you pray. So every single night you will pray taraweeh. If you cannot pray in the masjid, you'll pray at home. And for the sisters during the time that they cannot pray, then they can make up with dhikr. They can make up with dua. They can make up with other things. Don't just, and this is a problem that many of our sisters have, is that during that week, they're like, khalas, I'm on vacation. No. <laughs> You're on vacation from salah, okay. But not from dua, not from dhikr. How about seeking knowledge in that week? Listen to lectures that week. Do other things, right? Other acts of worship that you can do that will bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third thing is that this Ramadan, make sure that you do an act of charity that you've not done before. Do something above and beyond. Sponsor an orphan, right? Find a poor family. The best charity, my dear brothers and sisters, the best charity. Human appeal won't like when I say this, but uh, don't, don't, uh, don't throw anything at me. The best charity, wallahi, is to find a family in your community or an orphan, or a, uh, anybody, a widow in your community. 
that people are not aware of. You hunt them down properly with adab, with respect. You find out where are the people who are too shy to ask for help, but they need help. And then you just give the money without even them knowing where the money came from. That is the highest form of charity, where you help the righteous religious people in your own community who are too embarrassed to go around doors asking. La yas'alun nas al hafa Allah says, they're not begging, you go find them. There's a widow in your vicinity, she's got three kids, she's struggling, but she's got too much dignity to go knocking on doors. But you hear about her, she's struggling to make ends meet. Just quietly gift something outside of her house, bring the groceries in the morning, she wakes up, she finds groceries. That's real charity. And you don't need to be rich to do that. We can all afford some canned goods, some groceries. We can all afford some types of, if they have children, give some food, some uh, toys, some toys, get some toys for Eid. You know, make her, make her happy. And you don't, she doesn't need to know. Or whoever, he, sometimes people are poor, it doesn't matter. Give them help and they don't even know where it came from. You can do that much without anybody knowing. These are the three things I advise myself and you, okay? Yes? <coughs> Uh, Sheikh, what advice would you give to somebody who struggled a lot with intention, especially uh, with waswasas and whatnot, excessively? So, to struggle with waswasa is a common problem and it afflicts every single human being. And to be aware that you are struggling with waswasa is healthy. Because the problem comes when you don't even care about it. To be aware that, oh my God, I have a problem. I'm not saying waswasa is healthy. I'm saying to be aware of waswasa is healthy. There's a difference between the two. And alhamdulillah, it's a sign that there is some sincerity. The fact that you're struggling with sincerity. Is that clear? Because if you weren't struggling with sincerity, then you're very insincere. All of us are struggling with insincerity. It's just at different levels. The minute that you're not worried about sincerity, that's when you clearly are insincere. So the main advice that I give myself and you when it comes to waswasa is to keep on asking Allah for ikhlas and to try to do as many good deeds in secret as you can. Because waswasa can only affect public deeds. It cannot affect private deeds. If you stand up in the middle of the night and pray to Hajj that nobody knows, there is no waswasa. So you're worried about waswasa, then make sure you have plenty of private deeds that nobody knows about. That's why our Prophet said, give charity so that even your left hand doesn't know what your right hand gives. Meaning, metaphorically, nobody should know as much as you can. So, there are certain things you have to do publicly. You have to pray in the masjid taraweeh publicly. As men, you're not gonna, you know, if you have time, you're not gonna pray taraweeh at home, or you shouldn't. I mean, you should go to the masjid. That's a public thing, okay? You're giving charity sometimes, you give publicly so people know that you're supporting the cause so that others give as well. So when you do those things publicly, Make sure you have a healthy dosage you're doing behind the scenes privately. And that will make up for, inshallah, any waswasa. Back to the sisters. Anything from the sisters? Going once, going twice. Back to the brothers. Yes. Um, there's an event uh, that is actually recorded in Bangladesh, it's something that my family does as well. But the more I read about it, I find it bigger. So could you share some light that I can tell my family? Uh, so there are things that uh, have been added culturally to our ummah. Uh, and Shab al-Birat is one of those things that doesn't seem to have much of a basis to it. Uh, at the same time, uh, my dear brothers and sisters, one needs to take into account the overall pros and cons of, of correcting and what time we use and how we correct. In other words, what I'm trying to say is, choose your battles wisely. And the fact that your family is involved in, let's say, Shab al-Birat, I don't approve of it. But perhaps you trying to correct them will actually turn them off from far bigger issues. So let me ask you, I'm not, you don't have to answer, I'm just speaking out loud. Is your family regularly praying five times a day? Don't answer, I'm just asking. If they're not praying five times a day, surely the bigger priority is to have them pray five times a day than to worry about Shabda Birat. Okay? Is your family involved in other major sins? Is, one of your members of your family opening a, 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 or having a store that says alcohol, for example. Surely that sin is a bigger sin that everybody can agree is a sin. So prioritize. And if your family is at such a level, mashallah, tabarakallah, that the next issue on the agenda is Shabbat Barat, then go for it. But generally speaking, and I'm speaking from experience of our own families and whatnot, there are big problems and Shabbat Barat or Milad nabi is really low on the list. And we make it the biggest problem and at the expense of problems that are 
some things that are far more important. So you don't have to participate, but if your family is not at that level, maybe you can put it in your heart, inshallah, at a later date, I'll correct them. You don't have to correct each and every thing instantaneously. There's a wisdom when it comes to da'wah, and the best da'wah you can give as a young member of the family is through your proper manners and respect and etiquette. Realize, usually, the general rule of thumb, <coughs> youngsters are not successful da'is to their parents and uncles and aunts. This is the general rule of thumb. And you will understand this when you have your own kids. When you change somebody's diapers, they're never qualified to tell you how to live life. <laughs> it's just human nature. Okay? So perhaps you know more than your mother and father, but they'll never realize that you know more than them. I, I should say perhaps you know more than your mother and father in some areas. Because when it comes to life, they always know more than you. Because they have more age and wisdom than you. Right? So perhaps you're not the best person to give da'wah about Shabb al to your father or mother. So give da'wah to them about manners, akhlaq, through your own manners. Through your own respect, through your own treatment of them. And slowly but surely when you win their respect, the time will come when they will come to you and say, why don't you do this? Then you will open up a polite dialogue, not an accusative, why do you do this? How do you do that? Rather, well, I like to follow the sunnah of the Prophet and I don't find this to be a good sunnah. That changes the whole dynamics when they come to you versus you coming uh, to them. Brothers and sisters, my... Uh, handlers are staring at me and pointing at the watch and whatnot because I have a major event in, in London as well. We have to drive up and knowing your traffic in these countries and these roads, subhanAllah, may Allah make it easy for you guys, you know. But alhamdulillah. So inshallah, I have to ask your leave. It was my pleasure to be uh, in Leicester and I hope inshallah next time we can come for a, a longer time. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.